final session then, um, and we're going to make up some time. Don't worry, we'll finish by lunch. This will only take 15 minutes or so. We're going to look at what happens after you've submitted your full application. Assuming I haven't completely put you off submitting a full application. Um, so we're going to have a look at, first of all, the project appraisal process and the selection criteria. Um, we're going to have a look at the contracting process and very briefly the component parts of a grant funding agreement, a GFA, a grant funding agreement as they're nowadays called. You might have heard them called offer letters or contract letters in the past. Grant funding agreement is the current terminology. I'm going to pick up on a few compliance issues. I'm going to mention the claims and reporting process I touched on uh, earlier. Performance and underperformance, more specifically, there are some new rules on that. And you will find a schedule in the grant funding agreement which rather confusingly suggests what might happen if you don't meet your targets at certain stages. I'm going to mention audit trail and document retention and the verification and audit regime, as it was, that you can look forward to if you have a project that is contracted. So let's kick off, first of all, just having a look at the high-level process here. Um, now, as I said, you can only submit a project in response to a call. The call will be developed partially by the managing authority and here in Cornwall partially by the ITI board. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, who will have a say in what goes into the call specification. In fact, I, th I think they have, probably have the final say here, don't they, under the, under the intermediary body status. Getting a bit technical here doesn't matter. Um, so the call would be published always by the managing authority um, and as you've seen there are two calls out at the moment and more to come. So what will happen uh, then is that uh, it will go into, an outline application will be submitted after the call has been publicised and the closing date has been and gone. The applic outline application will be assessed against the outline, against the project selection criteria, sorry, which includes the gateway criteria and the core criteria even at the outline stage. And I'll say what those criteria are in just a moment. Uh, if it gets through, well, what happens then, interestingly enough, and I haven't mentioned this before, is that it will go to the ITI board in the case of Cornwall. The ITI board will receive a case paper from the managing authority, which you won't see, but it will go to the ITI board, and it will be a summary of the assessment that's been made against the project selection criteria. And the ITI board will be asked if the project has strategic fit with the needs of Cornwall, the ITI strategy, uh, and they will be asked whether or not they think the project represents value for money in terms of an investment of the structural funds into that particular project within Cornwall. Um, there is no right to access structural funds. They may just decide they don't think like your project particularly. It may be perfectly eligible. There's no, there's no right or guarantee. Just because it's eligible doesn't mean it gets approved. So they may say no. Hopefully they'll say yes. If they say yes, and the managing authority's technical appraisal means that they think it's eligible and fits with the scope of the call, uh, then it will, you will get your letter saying you are very well done, you've gone through the first stage of the process, we invite you to submit a full application by X date, which is probably about eight weeks or so, um, and you'll be allocated a DCLG or a DWP case officer that you can contact to discuss it. In uh, And this is different between where I work and... Cornwall, I think, because generally speaking, as almost as a matter of course, I think, in my area, you get invited to a meeting with the managing authority to discuss the letter. But I gather that doesn't happen here so often. It has happened, but not so much general practice. We had a discussion last time round about people's experience of um, these meetings taking place. I have to say, from, from a kind of personal perspective, I think those meetings do take place. They do? Oh, OK, yeah. that's good. That's good. It helps. So Gareth, can you just clarify where the LEP fits in on all this? Because they publish the calls, don't they? They sort of decide where the money's going to be spent. Uh, well, technically, it's the, um, it's the managing authority. Who, who the, the calls are published by the managing authority, yeah. so by DCLG or DCLG. But it's on the recommendation of the local so enterprise the partner. Representatives on the ITI board. It's the ITI board, right. which is the... Yeah. yeah. You, have, you have a slightly different structure here in Cornwall than we have in in my usual patch, where the local enterprise partnership tends to have the ERDF facilitation team and interacts with the managing authority. But here you have the ITI board, because, and you also have an intermediary body, don't you? The Cornwall County Council is an intermediary body, so it has a bit more authority over what goes in the calls and the process than is the case in some other parts of the country. Um, but it's all part of a national programme. I, mean, I think in practical terms, 
does it really make a lot of difference? Probably not, I suspect. It's probably a very similar process. But So in, in uh, we would call these ESIF committees in most areas. What you might notice, I've got a little sticker over here, because I <laughs> in most presentations I would put ESIF committee here, European Structural Investment Funds Committee, which is usually led by the LEP. But in your area it's different because you've got this ITI so this board. Is all out from the scratch. No one's saying anything either. Well, why wasn't Cornwall trying to be in charge? There were discussions previously about intermediary intermediary body status, which go back a couple of years ago. Um, As Andy mentioned, IV status is now something that's part of the devolution deal for Cornwall. It's now, I think it's not always just going to happen now. Okay. So, so Cornwall would have more kind of local control in this case because it's the yeah. cause. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, a diplomatic way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> so you will uh, develop your full application, and it will then un- un- be un- uh, it will then undergo, I should say, a full technical appraisal. Uh, you know, focusing very much on compliance issues. As a matter of fact, procurement, state aid, eligibility scope of the project proposal or whatever, full technical appraisal. It will then go back to the ITI board, who will be asked the same question they were asked in the first place, because projects do change from the outline to the full application stage. You can, in developing your project, you might decide to make a few changes. There's nothing wrong with that. It's perfectly allowable. Uh, you can't just come up with a completely different idea to the one you submitted, because that would be out of scope of the call and would be rather circumventing the process, but obviously changes in your project proposal from outline to full application stage are perfectly normal. There is a section on the form which allows you to highlight where you've made changes since the outline application. I would expect that to normally be the case because the more you look in detail at it, the more you might change the resource, the targets, whatever. So it goes back to the ITI committee. Uh, They say, yeah, that's fine. And then the managing authority, if they're happy, will produce a grant funding agreement, GFA. So that's the high-level business process, if you like. But what's important... You'll notice there's local consultation going on here, at this level here. It's not just the managing authority, they are consulting locally. And that, in my experience, that's a bit of the programme that actually works quite well. The engagement of partners within the delivery of the programme in local areas, I think has been one of the successes of the structure that they came up with. Uh, I mean, in the area that I sit in, you know, it's, it's engaged quite a lot of interest in structural funds that wasn't there before. Um, so it's been quite successful. Can't speak for Cornwall, it's not my usual area, of course. So um, let's have a look at the project selection criteria. It, has, it is published. You can see it. You can download it from the .gov website. Um, it's required to be published by the regulations, of course. Open and transparent process. It's not procurement, but it's published anyway. Uh, there's gateway criteria and core criteria. Uh, you will see, um, well actually you probably won't see, but in the case papers that go to the ITI committee, um, it will be scored usually on the basis of... Uh, Yes, it meets the requirements. No, it doesn't meet the requirements. Or it partially meets the requirements. Partial score is quite common. Nothing to worry about. It usually means they've got some questions to ask you or some conditions to apply. It looks like it's state A compliant, but we haven't seen the legal advice. So the applicant is required to produce their legal advice with the full application. It's not a problem. It's, it's the usual, they'll give a partial marking. It still goes through on a partial marking because they haven't got the full evidence they need to assess the project. So let's have a look at the gateway criteria then. Um, this is the minimum eligibility requirements which must be met to ensure that an ERDF or ESF project can receive support. You'll see that there are only three questions here. The first effectively relates to the project applicant. Are they eligible to apply for funding? So are they a legal entity? Going back to a previous slide. Are they, are they capable of applying for funding? Are they a lead partner perhaps in a partnership project? Do they have the capacity to enter into a grant funding agreement, a contract with the managing authority to deliver this project? The second question is, is the activity eligible for support under the national rules for ESF or ERDF, national eligibility rules? Fairly obviously they need to know that. Uh, If it fits with the scope of the call, it probably is, because obviously otherwise they wouldn't have defined that activity within the, the call. And finally, does it actually respond to the call, which is almost the same as the third question, isn't it? The second question, sorry. Um, Is it actually going to produce um, 
is it going to help deliver outputs and results that are relevant to the call? So is it within scope for the call? Does it respond to the call criteria? Uh, is it within scope? So you've got three questions there. Uh, if it passes all of those, or even if it has a partial on one of those, it can still go through the process and you can get your letter. Subject, of course, as I say, that, that last question in particular is one they will consult the ITI board about because that's about strategic fit. Is this project the one we want to go through the process and meet our requirements? It's possible, and you don't know this, well, you may or may not know this, but uh, you may be responding to a call and 10 other organisations have sent in similar projects and there's only enough money to fund one of these projects. So they might actually have to select one project over another, which is when questions like, is the applicant best place to deliver this come into play? Is the partnership the one we want to deliver this? Are they best placed? Because we can't fund all these projects, we're only going to fund one of them. So the core selection criteria, as you might imagine, is a little bit more intensive. It looks at the strategic fit of the proposal to the call and the operational priority axis. It looks at the value for money, which as I said earlier is the cost of the project against the deliverables, so the unit costs of those activities. Uh, it's very crude literally multiplies the cost of the project against the deliverables to give you a unit cost. It will look at the management and control uh, systems that you have set out in your full application, how you're going to manage, how you're going to control the financial aspects of the project, how you're going to manage the project. Maybe you have a governance board, maybe you have a project manager and a staff that will manage it, all those things will be looked at. They're going to look at your track record. If you've managed projects before and made an awful hash of them, had to pay the money back. You're going to be starting from a low base as far as they're concerned. Do they really want to risk giving you more structural funds money? If you've got a brilliant track record in managing funds, then that's really, really helpful. If you've no track record or two at all, but you've managed other public funding, that will be really helpful as well. Or if you've managed other types of EU funding, that will be helpful. So there'll be a risk assessment. It will look at your financial capacity as well because of the cash flow issue. Only if, you're, only if you're private sector. If you're public sector, there's no financial capacity assessment. It's just assumed that there's no problem. It will look at compliance with procurement, state aid, publicity, eligibility rules, of course. And it will look at the cross-cutting themes. So if it's approved, then it will uh, go on to the contracting phase. I'm just going to mention strategic fit here because it's important in terms of the assessment of the project. So it contributes to the needs opportunities identified in the call, so it meets the scope of the call. Um, it represents an appropriate means of delivering the specified objectives and meets the priorities of the operational programme. It aligns to the growth needs set out in the operational programme. I think we've covered that. Um, it must add value and not duplicate existing provision. I know I'm repeating what I said in the first presentation. But you will need to show what existing provision there is in your area that's similar and how, if, if there is similar provision, then you can say how your proposal differentiates from that and fills a gap that needs to be filled. If it simply duplicates other provision that's already there, be it other EU-funded provision or national programmes, then obviously it's going to run into difficulties with the question of additionality. So you're going to reach the happy stage of receiving a grant funding agreement. and You can have a look at these on the .gov website. There are blank versions. This is one of them. You'll see it's got a big red marker on it saying it's not an offer letter. It's simply an example of a grant funding agreement. They're quite lengthy, 36 to 52 pages, plus appendices. Your full application is in theory appended to the application. So what you've said you're going to do in your project will simply get appended to the full application and become part of the contract. It goes back to what I said about the scope of the project earlier on. You can't then go off and do something slightly different because it will be out of scope of your grant funding agreement because that is part of your contract. If you want to change it, go and ask, ask them. Send in a project change request. It may be possible to make some changes to the project. The format is a deed of grant, so it's a slightly more formal process than just signing a contract. Um, it, just, it just gives it slightly additional legal credibility. Um, not particularly important. In the grant funding agreement, you'll find a, a formal, what we call an offer letter, so an offer of grant. It will say how much ERDF they're going to commit to this project. That's called the offer letter part of the grant funding agreement, the grant offer. So you're going to write and say that you accept the offer of the grant as part of your acceptance of the grant funding agreement. It's going to include a load of standard grant conditions. There are pages and pages of them. I just want to caveat, I mean, of course, read them. It's important to read them. If you have any questions about them, then ask the managing authority. Do not attempt to haggle on the standard conditions because you are wasting your time 
I just worked with a university that spent six months haggling on the standard conditions, despite me advising them they were wasting their time. They will not change any of the standard conditions. They've contracted 500 projects on ERDF alone with the same standard conditions. They're not going to change them just for your project. Forget it. And this is an unequal relationship in law, isn't it? In most contracts you negotiate, you're not negotiating here. You either accept their conditions to get the money or you don't accept them and don't get the money, your choice. There's no negotiation on the standard conditions. The standard conditions are generally fine anyway. There are some questions, some universities ask questions about intellectual property. Um, You can ask for clarifications, that's fine as well. But what you can't do is negotiate on them. So I just caution sending them to a lawyer, getting a lawyer to pour through them. It's it's wasting your time and money, quite frankly. Project-specific conditions usually are straightforward. They normally relate to something to do with the partial marking on the appraisal that requires you to do something you haven't already done. It might be, for example, to produce a suite of forms and processes that you're going to use in operating the project that you haven't done at the application stage and send them in by X date. It might be to sign up a partnership agreement with a delivery partner. Um, those are negotiable. You can change those. Sometimes you can say, well, we're not going to do it this way or we want to do something else and they will agree to change those. But normally they're not particularly controversial anyway. There will be an expenditure profile, which will be the financial table that you sent in saying you're going to spend X amount of money each year and each quarter. Um, Stick to that. They they won't send you one and say this is what we want you to do. They will only accept the one you've sent them unless they've queried it during the appraisal process. So you are stuck with it unless you write and change it. So if you then spend half the money you said you're going to spend, it's not helping them meet their spend targets, then you will run into problems with the project. So be very careful when you profile the spend of the project. Likewise, exactly the same with the targets. And and I, I would suggest with the targets as much as is reasonably possible, backload them. Because uh, I'm not suggesting you put all of your targets in the last quarter of the last year of your project, because that would be obviously ridiculous. But uh, don't, don't just spread them across the project. Um, try and look sensibly. At, you know, there's always a delay in getting things running. It takes a while for projects to get up and running, etc., etc. Backload them to the end as much as you reasonably can, because nobody will complain if you exceed your targets. Uh, but if you, don't, if you don't meet your targets, if you're below targets, then potentially there can be financial penalties. So push them back as much as you can reasonably justify in the application. Uh, it will help you in the long term. Then if you exceed them, they'll be going, oh, that's really good. This project's exceeding its targets. <laughs> Excellent news. No problems at all. This is what we want. Uh, so there is underperformance methodology I'll come on to in a minute. And uh, the full application form is appended to the project. Claims process I've kind of covered already, haven't I? Normally quarterly, uh, it's currently a pay- well, it's currently in spreadsheets, really, in electronic forms. Uh, it's got to be web-based, as it happened just by pure coincidence on Friday. I was hanging around, as I do in the DCLG office on Friday, my local area, waiting to meet somebody. And one of my former staff said to me, oh, do you want to have a look at our new computer system? So he showed me the old e-claim system. <laughs> I've now seen it up and running. It's the new system, which is, I can't believe we're in... August 2017, and they still haven't got their computer system up and running for claims. It's absurd, isn't it? We'll be out of the EU by the time it's working, (laughs) which is rather absurd. So they are moving to this e-claim system where everything will be done electronically on on the web. You'll put claims in on the web. um, At the moment, you have to email them a spreadsheet and a claims form, and they actually enter it on the system at DCLG or DWP. They're going to use the same system, by the way, for ESF and ERDF. You have to provide a transaction list which is a list of all of the transactions that you are including in the expenditure, uh, you will have to usually provide a percentage of source documentation for that, usually at their request, because they're going to do desk checks on all of the claims. They may ask you for additional evidence when you send the claim in, justify the claim. But generally speaking, you just have to do a transaction list and not provide all of the paperwork beyond that. But you have to keep that paperwork, of course, for future audits. You're going to have to produce a narrative of progress against milestones, any claim for e- evidence, outputs and results needs to be needs to have an audit trail. So if you've claimed, and each indicator, I know we haven't had time to go through this, but each indicator, so for example, if your project's going to create new jobs, uh, then how do you evidence a new job? Well, you'll probably get a copy of the advert for the job from the employer. You'll get a ch- copy of the job description. 
Um, you make you get a signed statement from the employer to say we've recruited somebody into this job and we estimate the job's going to last for a year or more, which is the criteria for counting a job. Uh, you may even uh, get some, the person who's in the job to sign a statement to say they're now in the job and doing this job. So the, the indicator definition will tell you what the evidence needs to be to justify claiming that output. So you have to send that in with your claim if you're going to claim that output, the evidence trail for the output, That's to give, just to give you an example. Uh, all claims subject to administrative checks, as I just said, which means desk checks. They're just going to check the claim at the managing authority. How are we doing for time? Oh, five minutes. Come on, hurry up. Um, irregularity. I'm just going to mention, I've mentioned the word irregularity a few times. And irregularity, as it says on the screen here, it doesn't mean fraud. It just means that an unjustified item of expenditure has been charged to the budget of the project. A systemic irregularity is where this is happening uh, Regularly, for example, if you've, mis- if you've got a system that miscalculates the salary cost within your project because the, the system you're using is wrong, there's a systemic irregularity. So they can extrapolate that irregularity through the project and say, well, we found this error and this error is the same. And actually, we've discovered that it's your system that's causing this error. So therefore, we extrapolate the cost of that error through the project. So that can happen sometimes. <laughs> Anyone can make a mistake. So... That is okay. Uh, If they identify the mistake before the claim has been paid, um, there is a process to go through self-declared, what they call it, self-declaration process where you can uh, amend the irregularity and it doesn't affect the project. If they've paid the claim, you've had the money, and then they find the irregularity, it can be taken off the ERDF or ESF you've been allocated for the project. That's what one of the senior managers at DCLG used to call the unforgiving nature of structural funds, unforgiving. You've, there's a mistake, but we're going to take the money off you. Even if you tell them you've made the mistake, they still take the money off you. So in other words, they reduce the amount of ERDF you've had in your offer letter by the amount of the irregularity. And you can't, you can't just say, well, oh, sorry about that, I made a mistake. We'll just make sure it's spent on the right item next time. They take it off the project. So you have a reduction in the grant available to the project if it's a formal irregularity. Same if it's spotted by an auditor at a later date. So cannot be used, as you'll see here, it can be used in the programme, but cannot be used in the same project, is my point. It's taken off the project. Now this is, um, I know you can't see this very well, this is a new approach. I've yet to see it actually used, but I'm sure it will be. This is, uh, you'll find this in, a, I think it's in Schedule 4 of the grant funding agreement. You'll find an underperformance matrix and definition. Effectively what it means is that if you are 15% short of your target, that might be okay. You can discuss that through a project change with your case officer. However, if you're between 16 and 25%, you could have a 5% weighted financial correction, depending on the importance of the indicator. And it goes on. 26 to 50% can be 10%. Over 50% could result in a 15% financial correction. And there's a rather complex methodology here and selection of indicators to, to work that out, uh, which I'm not going to go through. Document retention, um, there's some guidance on that. Um, it's, people used to say to me, well, how long have we got to keep the documents for? And that would be a nice, easy question. Under the old programme, I'd say December 2025, which is a long time. Can't say that anymore because the new rules are more complicated. And this is because you don't know when you've got to keep the documents to because the documents are dependent on when the managing authority has submitted its accounts to the commission for that year and had its accounts approved. Of course, you know nothing about that. It's nothing to do with you whatsoever. You've no idea if the managing authority have included your project expenditure in their accounts. You've no idea if the commission have approved their accounts or not for the given year. So the managing authority should write out to you and tell you, we've now had that expenditure approved. You, can t- you, can, you have to keep these documents for a further two years. Uh, however, I'll just caveat that by saying that if you've got a state aid in the project of any sort, particularly de minimis, you have to keep the records for 10 years. That's nothing to do with the ERDF rules, that's the state aid rules. So you might as well keep the records for 10 years just to be safe. That would be my advice. Think about keeping the records for 10 years after the end of the project. Uh, Particularly for state aid, you have to do that anyway. Um, So why not just apply it anyway? You might as well just... You don't want two systems, do you? It's going to cause problems... Just finally then, uh, management verification, uh, sorry, the, uh, the audit and verification regime. Um, they would almost always call these audits nowadays, by the way, whether the, but they're actually verification. Verification is carried out by the managing authority. 
in other words, the staff from DCLG or DWP, and they may come out, well, they will come out to visit your project a number of times. First of all, they'll do what's called a project inception visit, a PIV. It's the first visit they will do to your project. They'll come out and they'll run through the grant funding agreement, check your systems, ask if you understand the document retention rules and the publicity rules and all this kind of stuff. They'll go through that. Um, and that's meant to help, be helpful. It's an uh, upfront compliance meeting. Welcome them with open arms. Take their advice. They'll do a report. I suggest you might make one or two changes if it's necessary. Really helpful stuff. Before anyone has submitted any claims or done anything else, they will do some checks, which is good. Uh, they may come out and do an on-the-spot verification. In fact, they almost certainly will during the course of the project. OTSV. OTSV means they will come out to your offices, sit in your office and go through the source documentation for the project. So it's like an audit. They'll, they'll call it an audit. In technical terms, it's a management verification under the regulations carried out by the managing authority. Now, there are also audits. Audits are carried out by the Government Independent Audit Authority, the GIAA, as they're called, which is part of the Treasury. It's separate from the managing authorities. They have no control over it. There's a big difference between the audit and the verification, not in what they actually do. But the management verification is what we call ex ante, in other words, before the expenditure has been defrayed. They're checking your claim. They're checking a claim that hasn't yet been claimed from the Commission. An audit is always ex post, after the claim has already been paid, and in theory already included in a claim to the Commission, but you won't know that. Then it comes to the attention of the audit authority. They can select it for an independent audit. And, of course, if they find an irregularity, it's probably going to be taken off of your grant offer letter value. It's possible, and I, I foolishly said this at one of the previous seminars, it's possible, but incredibly unlikely, you will have the Commission auditors come out to visit you, or even worse, the European Court of Auditors coming out to visit you. They are entitled to do so. I said that, and a guy at the back collared me, actually, at the lunch when he said, we've had all of those come to see our project. <laughs> And I said, oh, oh, sorry about that. It's incredibly unusual. I said, was it a big... Because normally if it's, you know, if it's a £100 million project, yes, they might come out and see it because it's on their radar. He said, no, it, was only a, it wasn't a very big project. Well, that is extremely unusual. I have no idea why they selected that project for such a kicking. <laughs> but, uh, very, uh, I mean, generally speaking, the, the point is the Commission is supposed to rely on the verification and the audit. They don't have to come out and visit because they're reliant on these systems to check compliance of expenditure. So why do they need to come out as well? If the Commission or the court auditors come out, they are, they are also checking that the auditors are doing their job and the verification people are doing their job, as well as looking at the, the projects. And I just... Oh, I could, have I got time just to tell my joke very quickly? Um, audits on ESF... I mean, they can be very frustrating because we do have this audit culture in structural funds. Um, that is that um, rather than looking at the project thinking, this is really good, it's helped... 200 people into work that were previously unemployed. And there's an example of this in ESF. We had an ESF auditor who was known as... He, thankfully, he's retired now, so I can say this. He was known as Mr Bus Ticket. <laughs> and he went out to a project, and uh, the project applicant said, this is a really good project. Look what we've done. We've helped 300 people into work that were previously long-term unemployed. Fantastic results. They've got qualifications as well. And he went... Yeah, that's all very well. Where are the bus tickets? <laughs> and uh, there were some missing bus tickets because they were paying expenses for people to come to the travel to the training sessions. Missing bus tickets. And he was obsessed with bus tickets to the point at which the project were very angry and said, this is ridiculous. You know, he won't, he's not interested in all the good work we've done. He's only interested in the fact that there are three missing bus tickets in the project. This is an absurd piece of nonsense. Well, unfortunately, that's the way it works because they are interested in compliance, they're not, they don't take the wider view of whether the project is delivering something useful or not. It's really frustrating, but they are about the audit trail, they are about compliant expenditure, uh, they are about compliance with national and public rules in relation to procurement, state aid, etc., etc. So I'm afraid that is the culture of uh, structural funds that you have to deal with. Let me just finish then by saying there is extensive guidance available, and I, I'm not, I haven't listed all here, but there's lots of guidance on lots of different issues. Knowing what it is you need to look up is sometimes the challenge, I know. The guidance, in many cases, I've said this before, is very, very good. In some cases, it leaves you with questions that aren't answered, which is frustrating and annoying, but I do strongly recommend that you look at it. If you ring the managing authority, they'll almost certainly tell you to look in the guidance first. Um, if you really have a difficult question, I can probably go through these guys, um, or, uh, you know, it can be raised. I've raised questions with them. Um, uh, 
what I normally do is say, in my view, we should do this because this is, seems to fit with the rules, and they, they'll usually say, yeah, we agree with you. Or sometimes, in, in one case, they even referred my query. I rang up and said, well, where's my query? I sent this in three weeks ago. Ah, we've had to refer it to the National Eligibility Rules Committee for an interpretation. In other words, they don't know the answer to the question, so they've got to meet and, and discuss it and then perhaps include it in one of their uh, revisions of the eligibility uh, guidance. So that, that can happen. To, to be fair, it's not possible to write a set of rules that cover every eventuality. It's just not feasible. So there will always be issues that come up which it's hard to find the answer to. It's just the nature of the way things work. But look in the guidance first. It answers 99% of questions, and hopefully you'll be able to get the information you want from there or ask somebody who, who uh, perhaps knows the answer. So uh, are there any questions on uh, the final session? What time's lunch? <laughs> All right, well, in that case... Uh, You'll be so pleased to hear that you won't have to listen to my voice anymore. So can I thank you very much for your uh, perseverance sitting through four presentations on technical stuff on structural funds. I really hope there's something in amongst all of that lot that you found useful um, and that you can take away and use in the development or delivery of your projects. Uh, I'm tempted to say I wish you good luck, but of course you don't need luck. It's all about proper process and good ideas and innovative projects and I know I've sort of focused on the barriers and the challenges, but it is worth doing. Uh, there are lots of projects up and running that deliver some really excellent uh, outcomes. So I would encourage you not to be put off by what I've said, uh, but to see that there are, means, there are ways and means of getting around these challenges and delivering really good projects that uh, support the economic growth and benefits of your area. So thank you very much for your attention. I will be hanging around at lunch and afterwards as well. If anybody has any more questions you want to ask me, very happy to do that. My email is on the slide as well. So if you think of a question after the seminar you wish you'd asked but uh, didn't, by all means drop me an email. I can't undertake to review all your projects and, all, you know, and deal with all that kind of stuff, to be honest, but I'm happy to answer questions on the subjects that we've covered and other subjects as well, really. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.